All right, tonight's topic is the corruption of the animal kingdom. And uh, I personally have never heard anyone speak about this. I haven't seen any videos about it or read any articles about it. Corruption. But I think that it's an interesting topic that we can look at. And the Bible does have quite a lot to say about animals. There's only 125 animals mentioned in the Bible, but there's uh, supposedly up to 8 million species. But that's another story. Now, originally, there was no sin. And there was no violence and there was no fear between animals and humans. Well, now it's different. And things have changed quite a lot. Animals uh, keep their distance from humans. They're afraid of them. But what happened? What went wrong? When And when did it go wrong? Who's responsible for it? And what's the extent of the damage? Those are the issues that I want to look at. Now I'm going to start off with Genesis 1, 29. This is on the sixth day of creation. And God said, see, I have given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of all the earth and every tree whose fruit yields its seed. And to you it shall be for food. And also to every beast of the earth, to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth in which life there is life, I have given every green herb for food. Then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. Now, so far so good. And at that time, there were no carnivorous animals. In fact, apparently there was no death. And it specifically says the food for, the, for animals and humans would be the green herb. It would be vegetation. It would be food for everything. So you didn't have any carnivorous animals. But of course, now we have carnivorous animals in there. And they're also in the fossil record, which I'm going to be talking about too. Now let's go to uh, Genesis 2.19. What? What? Okay. I don't know who that is. I'm going to mute everybody. All right, well, and it says, what, in Genesis 2.19, whatever Adam, call, Adam called each living creature, that was its name. Apparently that will happen in one day. Now, it was not specifically every species, but there weren't as many species back then. But, there's, but it's clear that Adam was never afraid of these creatures. They were never afraid of him. That came later. And... Animals do need other animals, and animals sure do need people. And even now, that's pretty rare for animals to do that. And I know I've, I've tried to find out what percentage of animals are carnivorous. Uh, I haven't been able to find that out, but uh, only a small percentage of animals are carnivorous. I, can, I know in Wisconsin, I can only name three, and that would be uh, we've got some wolves and we've had some cougars. And it's a bobcats, and those are, I, I believe, the only carnivorous animals in the whole state of Wisconsin. And uh, bears, you guys got bears. Well, they're not bears. carnivorous, though. Don't they eat meat and berries? berries? Yeah, well, well, they don't. They, 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 first of all, they're really not. It's only polar bears that are carnivorous and grizzlies. And I guess some grizzlies, but uh, they, they have been known to attack people, but they don't actually eat people, which I'm getting to. Uh, okay. Uh, all right, now I'm going to go to Genesis 9, 2, and 3. This is uh, after the flood. Now, wait a minute. You know, uh, Okay, I'll say that. And, and the fear of you and the dread of you shall be on every beast of the earth, on every bird of the air, and that all that move on the earth and all the fish of the sea, they are given into your hand. They have a natural fear of humans, and they will keep their distance. Now, that is for their protection and for our protection. And it's also a barrier that, was, that came into place from human sin. Now, sin started in the spirit world. It spilled over into the human world, and then it spilled over into every other life form on the planet, uh, and even down to the microbial world. But I'm just going to focus on the animal kingdom. And it's created a barrier between humans and animals. There originally was no barrier and there was no fear between humans and animals, but that was instituted just after the flood. Now, remember, 
when when Noah was collecting these animals, people have said, "Well, how did he find all these animals? How did he hunt them down?" Well, they didn't. He didn't have to hunt them down at all. The Bible says that they showed up to his where he was, so they could get on the ark. And they didn't have any fear of humans at that time, but God was leading them, and he didn't have to go and hunt these animals at all. And people were still apparently all animals, uh, originally all animals were vegetarians, but that didn't stay that way. And in fact, we're only talking about a 17th century gap between the creation and the flood. And in, uh, in that time, animals were already carnivorous. So how did this happen? When did it happen? Who's responsible? Well, we've got something known as, okay, now there's people are going to say that Satan's rebellion was billions of years ago. And there's another uh, uh, way of looking at this where you could say, well, maybe the satanic rebellion did not happen until shortly after Adam and Eve were created. And there is certainly a case to be made for that. Because, like I said, uh, originally, there were no carnivorous animals, but then that changed. Why did it change? When did it change? It happened after Adam and Eve were created. Now, there's this so-called gap theory, which is what uh, we were familiar with in worldwide, which is what sa which, which it says that there was an original creation a very long time ago, billions of years ago, and then it was destroyed. Then it was replaced with a new creation about 6,000 years ago. And there is somewhat of a case to be made for that, but there are some problems with that scripturally and scientifically. And the main one, the main problem with that is that uh, first, these, the fossils and the fossil record are not millions of years old at all. And that's been disproven because they contain red blood cells, soft tissue, and carbon-14. Anything with carbon-14 in it has to be less than 60,000 years old. And that's going to uh, Encyclopedia Britannica. Now, carbon-14 is not a totally reliable system, but one thing I will say with confidence, anything with carbon-14 in it has to be less than 60,000, probably much less. So it can't be millions of years old. And this discovery was made in March of 2005 in North Carolina by Dr. Mary Schweitzer. And... Uh, I first learned about it in January of 2010 when they showed it on 60 Minutes. And I was stunned. And I thought, wow, how come I haven't heard about this? Why isn't this being reported? I don't think it would have ever been reported if it weren't for the internet. But you can look it up yourself. There's soft tissue, red blood cells, and carbon-14, and dinosaur fossils that supposedly go back over 80 million years. And there's carbon-14 in all different layers. Now, supposedly these layers were accumulated very gradually over a very long period of time, but that's not what the evidence actually shows. So how old are these fossils? Well, all I can tell you is that they're less than 60,000 years old. They're not millions of years old. And a lot of the things in the fossil record are still around today. And if there was a gap, was it very long? So I'm going to say that the corruption of the animal kingdom, as I understand it, was not until shortly after Adam and Eve were, were first uh, created. Now, I don't know if, uh, if you got a problem with that, but uh, I'm just going by the evidence here. And this does fall into the realm of speculation, but that is legal. We can do that. I try not to, but I do. All right, now... We have creatures that are carnivorous. We have other things that are extinct that I think are just downright disturbing. Most notably, you get the T-Rex, the Velociraptor, and the, the Pterodactyl. They were carnivorous uh, reptile. And of course, the most famous one, uh, of course, is named Sue, and it's on display at the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago. It was found in Southwestern South Dakota, and it's enormous. And uh, you have to wonder, where did these things come from? How could this have happened? Now, people have, a lot of people think that it's impossible for a demonic spirit to create a living thing. And that may be, I don't know, I don't know but it wasn't really necessary for them to do that. I'm going to tell you how I think this happened. 
I think we have a conflict between good and evil at every level of the creation. It's in the animal kingdom. And we have creatures that I think came from evil minds. Now, how could this have happened? Did they create a new living thing? Well, it wasn't really necessary for them to do that because all they had to do was alter the existing DNA. Now, people think that the word DNA is synonymous with the word genes. In fact, genes only make up 2% of the DNA molecule. Another 8% makes up uh, DNA information that regulates the genes. But then you've got another 90% that nobody seems to know why it's there. Well, that doesn't mean that it doesn't belong there, but nobody can explain that. And uh, they think that it's just there by accident. Well, that's a lot of genetic information, and it actually is used. I mean, it can be used. Only about a small percentage of it is used. But even in those simplest creatures, there's massive numbers of combinations, and that leaves a lot of room for mutations and alterations. And that's what I'm saying here. Now, as far as how many different combinations are uh, of, of uh, genetics are there in human genome, apparently there are as many combinations of human DNA as there are atoms in the entire universe. That's what I saw on TV. I mean, it's something to think about. It's a mind boggling number. It's incomprehensible, but it tells you just how much information there is just in the human DNA. The, po the possibilities, the combinations are literally almost endless. So I'm thinking that's how this could have happened. Then we had the flood, and then a lot of things apparently were wiped out. Now, did Noah bring uh, things like a T-Rex with him onto the ark? I, know, I don't know if you know who Ken Ham is, but I've been watching him for like 30 years, and he's great. He's a, he's a creation scientist, and, uh, and he thinks that Noah brought the T-Rex and other dinosaurs with him on the ark. That's debatable, and I think you have to remember that. Uh, even though the T-Rex is the best known dinosaur, they were actually very rare. There's only been about 20 of them that have ever been found. Uh, almost all of them were found in northeastern Montana and southern Saskatchewan along the Canadian border. Uh, the one, the, the big one, uh, Sue, was found in southwestern South Dakota. Supposedly there was a partial one found in Mongolia. But that's about it. And you're not going to find big dinosaur bones in the Midwest. They're just not going to be here. <clears throat> Those things are very, very rare. Now, there's a lot of creatures that are, that are very rare. They only occupy isolated places in the world. And I think that was the case with these large dinosaurs. They simply were not roaming the entire Earth. And I don't think no one even saw them. Yes, what? A couple things. Paul said from the kitchen that if they were on the earth, they'd be very small. They could even be babies or just hatched or hatchlings. So, right. Yeah, there, okay. There's a legend that when Marco Polo went to um, Asia, that the emperor of China had two baby stegosauruses that drew his chariot. Um, you also have the uh, images of dinosaurs on pottery down in um, South America. Right. Those so, are the Ica stones in, from Peru. And I talked about those right. and they, they have, uh, I mean, there's, ten, there's like over 20,000 of these and they depict all different kinds of dinosaurs and whoever carved them had to have seen them. They don't go back millions of years. And uh, right, right. they do, they do show a T-Rex. Yes. As, as far as Mark the reason we may not have found as many is because there could be so much still buried after the flood, you know, still buried in sedimentary um, rock, very deep, you know, just like when they found um, fine gold stones and sandals and clumps of coal in southern Illinois, there could easily have been, you know, large populations of these animals pre-flood, but we'll just never know what the true count was um, just because it was completely wiped. Just, you know, that's what God did. He tried to 
he wanted to wipe the slate clean and start over. Yeah. So maybe, maybe only a handful, you know, when Noah started things up again, whatever was released from the ark, um, you know, maybe they didn't reproduce as much as they did pre-flood. I don't know. I'm good. I'm good not knowing until the download, but, you know, just in general, that's our contribution from this end. Just to make sure I understand, you're not saying there are any existing alive today, right? What do you mean, um, Doug? Not that I know of. Um, there is a theory that there may be some in the ocean. Um, the, uh, the pleosaurs or whatever they are. But uh, I think I, I found a picture from the 60s where they pulled one up in a net. But, you know, frankly... I don't know, and, and please don't take this as disrespect. I, I don't care. Was, I'm, I'm good with not knowing. <laughs> well, um, we still have dinosaurs but, around. We just don't call them dinosaurs. We just call them reptiles. And that fish you were talking <laughs> about, that was the coelacanth, which supposedly went extinct 600 million years ago. Then one was caught in 1938 off of Madagascar. They never went yeah. extinct, and it's never, it was never near 600 million years old. And, uh, exactly. Exactly. and there's some other things, too, that they have found that um, are still, quote, unquote, alive that were a part of the fossil record, but they can't figure out why they're still around. But anyway, carry on, Mark. Don't, don't mean to hijack the presentation. All right. Now, you might a lot of people would think it would be blasphemous to say that certain living creatures are evil, but let's look at the way certain creatures are, are described in the Bible. Like I said, there's 125 animals in the Bible, and there's in this a uh, few cases where people are being described as vipers or serpents, mm -hmm. and it's a put down. Now that happened uh, in a few cases, let's look at, well, it's, it's in Matthew 3, 7. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, brood of vipers, who has warned you of the wrath to come? That was John the Baptist. Call him a brood of vipers. That's not really a compliment. That tells you something about what vipers are. Then let's go to Numbers 21, 6. Now, here's a case where God has used animals to curse people that happened in the wilderness numbers 21 6 so the lord sent fiery serpents among the people and they bit the people and many of the people of israel died they were murmuring and complaining about moses well these things there they were being used by god but that does that mean that he created them now and then you've got john 1 3 which says that all things were created through him so people are going to say that means that all things were created by him. No, it doesn't say they were created by him. They were created through him. And if he created uh, the spirit world, which he did, and they created things, then that means what they created would have been created through Christ. Mm -hmm. So you got to look at it that way. Bill has a question. Yes. Go ahead, Bill. And uh, just a reminder, raise your hand if you have a question. The hand is located... If you go to the bottom of your screen, a bar will pop up. And all the way over to the right-hand side, there's a thing called reaction. You click on that, and the, the hand is in there. So go ahead, Bill. We're not hearing you, Bill. I guess he didn't have a question. I'll take his hand off. All right. Well, I wanted to read Isaiah 59, 4 and 5. They conceive evil and bring forth vipers' eggs and weave the spider's web. Uh, here's another case where people are being uh, compared to serpents, and it's a put down. All right. Then you've got. Uh, Well, okay, if you have on Isaiah, Isaiah 14, 29, curse against Philistia. Do not rejoice, all of you, Philistia, because the rod that struck you is broken. For out of the serpent's roots will come a viper 
and its offspring will be a fiery flying serpent. It's a curse. And now God has used animals. There's only two instances where God, where animals have attacked people. And uh, in both of those cases, it was God's will. Now I'm going to go to what is it, first Kings. Uh, Second Kings 2, 28. This is about Elijah. Elisha. And he went up there from Beth to from there to Bethel. And as he was going up the road, some youths came up to him from the city and mocked him, saying, Go up, you bald head. Go up, you bald head. So he turned around and looked at them and pronounced a curse on them in the name of the Lord. And two fam- female bears came out of the woods and mauled 42 youths. Doesn't say that they killed them, but uh, they certainly hurt them. And I guess maybe they got uh, a message from that. Now, these these bears, bear attacks, of course, are very rare. In this case, the bears were not acting on their own will. They were acting on God's will. But I can tell you that bear attacks are very rare. And when they, when they do happen, it's usually because it's, when animals attack, it's because they feel threatened. Or if you're surprising them. I mean, if, they, if you scare them. And it's not their nature to attack people because they're afraid of people. Now, there have been some rare cases where bears have attacked people. And now, in the case of polar bears... Since 1870, there's only been two known cases where polar bears have ever killed anyone. And in uh, in one case, they were, uh, it was being provoked. Some teenagers were throwing rocks at it. Well, even for a teenager, that's pretty stupid. And that's what this reminds me of here. They were provoking, in this case, they were provoking God, they were provoking Elisha. And that's why this happened. But these things, uh, if they see you, they will not come, they will move the other way. They will not come towards you. And I've been up close to a po- uh, black bear. This is on the Stock Virginia Reservation. Uh, there was a bear that used to hang around there. And it was an old bear. And uh, if you didn't, if you would hold still, this thing was there to <clears throat> eat bird seed. But we were all walking around this thing, and we were getting within 10, 12 feet of it. And if you don't make any sudden moves and you keep calm, they won't mess with you. And... Uh, and they can sense if they're threatened. They usually can. Now, it's the same kind of thing with, uh, with dogs and other animals. And they do have a sixth sense about people. And, uh, and uh, there's a story about this that I want to relate. Is that uh, dogs are normally very friendly. Some people they don't like. Now, I remember uh, one time I saw a bumper sticker that said, if my dog doesn't like you, I don't like you. And I thought that actually does make sense. And I, I used to uh, go to a barber shop in Wauwatosa, Niso's barber shop on State Street. And this guy would have two dogs and a cat in there normally. And one of them was a Rottweiler. And for years, I would pet that dog. I'd pet both of these dogs at the same time. They loved me. And uh, But I knew a guy at the time. This is over 15 years ago. And, and uh, he went to that same shop. And he walked in there and sat down in the rut while he walked over to him and started growling at him. And uh, he tried to calm it down, and the thing jumped up and bit him in the face, ripped a big gash into his cheek. And I saw, I saw the damage. And I thought, wow, I, I thought that, that was a real friendly dog because I petted that same dog dozens of times, and it loved me. Well, I don't know, well why do you think it attacked him? I'll tell you why. I knew the guy for a long time. He's completely different from me. I don't want to say a whole lot about, about him, but uh, he wasn't the best of people. He was an ex-Marine, by the way. He was one of those Ura types. And uh, he was a brawler, too. He was a very violent guy. I've seen him flatten his brother's nose in a bar one time 22 years ago. But this dog didn't like him and it bit him. And it's funny how they can have that kind of a sense about people. And... Uh, People are, you know, the pit bulls and Rottweilers, they have a bad reputation, but I've petted pit bulls and I've petted Rottweilers and they love me. 
And if you treat a dog with love, they will, they are guaranteed to love you right back. But right now we do have a barrier between animals and humans that will not always exist. Now, if people have domesticated every kind of animal you could think of. And I, I love those stories, uh, especially one about a guy that he raised a polar bear from a cub and then kept it as a pet. Now it's full grown. It's like 800 pounds and they, and they swim together in a swimming pool stuff like that. And it's really affectionate. It's like a dog, you know, like a big white dog. And there's lots of stories like that. And that's how it will be again. And that's how it originally was. But right now we've got creatures that are, that are quite frankly evil. Now I'm going to, I'm going to go to how, how could this have happened? Well, who is to blame? I think that uh, there are demonic forces that did tamper with DNA and created evil creatures. And I think a lot of them were wiped out in the flood. And I think that was a deliberate thing. <clears throat> right about right now, I don't know. Maybe it's still going on. Maybe the creation is still going on. Now I want to read uh, from... <clears throat> well, okay, I suppose I'll read Isaiah 45, 7. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all of these things. Now, does that explain all the... Uh, the the, the, the diseases and the parasites and these carnivorous uh, creatures, I don't know. I don't think that's really quite it, but I thought it'd be worth looking at. Now, let's look at Romans 9.21. Does not the potter have power over the clay from the same lump to make one vessel for honor and another for dishonor? Now, in that case, it's talking about the ecclesia. It's talking about the human world that uh, certain people are created for honor, some for dishonor. But I think that that could also apply to the animal kingdom. And that's what we see here. Now, was it God that was behind it? Well, there is a case be made for that. But I have a hard time believing that. Now, if, with whatever is evil in his creation was is, is meant to be a temporary curse, whether it's from God or whether it's from Satan. Now, just remember, God has used Satan and demons to do his will in the past. <clears throat> All right. Now, where was I? I also want to talk about. All right. Well, then there's Leviathan. Isaiah 27, 1. In that day, the Lord, with a severe sword, great and strong, I will punish Leviathan, the fleeing serpent. Leviathan, the twisted serpent, and he will slay the reptile that is in the sea. Now, some people think it's still alive. I don't know, maybe it is. I think it's a metaphor for Satan. Satan is referred to as a serpent, serpent in Genesis 3. And I think in Isaiah 27, 1, Leviathan is a, also a metaphor for Satan. Leviathan is also mentioned in Job 41. 1 through 34, and it sounds like a literal creature. Maybe it is, but it can be used metaphorically as well. But here we have something that's a creature, a physical creature, that apparently has, is evil, and that's how it's being described. How did it get there? I think that's because demons were altering DNA. Now, let's look at 1 Peter 3, 19 through 20. This was just before the flood, by whom he also went and preached to the spirits in prison who formerly were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared. Now it's talking about demons that were being put away and restrained at the time of the flood. Why were they being put in, uh, why were they being restricted? Why were they being put in a prison? Because of what they were doing with the creation. That's what I think. And it's not just what they were doing with the human world. I think they were tampering with human DNA for a while. But it was they were also tampering with animal DNA. And that, I know that is what uh, it says in the book of Enoch. I'm not going to go over Enoch because it's not a reliable book. But I think Enoch was right about that. Now, in 2 Peter 2, 4, it says, For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness and reversed, reserved them for judgment, that apparently happened. At the time of the flood, they had gone so far off the rails, they were ruining God's creation. I think that they were tampering with the DNA, and I think that if it weren't for the flood, 
the demons probably would have completely ruined God's plan. <clears throat> and they had to be restrained. However, there are other demons around right now. And I also want to talk a little bit about the way that animals are classified. But wait a minute, I'm going to go to, well, okay, like I said, Adam, Adam named all the animals. Well, all the living creatures. Well, how many were there? And how could he have done this in one day? Well, the living uh, world is divided up into six categories. There's the kingdom, then there's the phylum, then there's the classes, then there's the order, and then it's divided into, subdivided into families, then there's genus, and then there's species. And in, a, in the case of uh, philia, there's 31 of them or 33 of them, depending on which source you want to look at. And then there's classes, there's six animal classes, fish, birds, mammals, reptiles, amphibi amphibians, and invertebrates. Uh, couldn't find the orders and families, but uh, how many species are there? Well, there's between 1.2 million and 8.7 million species in the world of animals. Now, that's quite a gap, a seven and a half million gap. And with all the scientific knowledge that we think we have, you'd think we'd have a little better idea of how many species there are in the world. Apparently, we don't have much of an idea. But then there's problems with how you want to define the word species. Now, it's pretty specific that it is actually consistent with the way the word Bible uses the word kind. The Bible doesn't use any of the words, these terms. It does use the word kind, and it says each animal produces reproduces after its own kind. That's consistent with the word species. However, there's at least 20 instances, 20 cases where different species can interbreed and produce a hybrid animal. That's how we had so many, that's why we have so many more species now than there were thousands of years ago. Now, let me give you some examples. There's a zebra and a horse can interbreed, a dolphin and a killer whale, a lion and a tiger, a lion and a leopard, a male tiger and a female lion produce a tiger. And then there's the beefalo, which is a cow and a buffalo. And there's the grizzly bear, which is a polar bear and a grizzly. There's the jaguar, it's a male jaguar and a female lion. And there's a, a sheep and a goat can interbreed a wolf and a dog, a camel and a llama, a domestic cat and a serval cat, a horse and a donkey, they produce a mule, which does not reproduce. Then there's the, uh, the domestic cattle and a yak, they can reproduce. A wild boar can breed with a domestic pig. A coyote can breed with a wolf. And even a, uh, there's the Nurlaga, the, the, it's a narwhal whale and a Bulag, beluga whale. They can interbreed, and they're producing these hybrids. But is that that is not a uh, corruption of nature? That is a natural process, and uh, new new forms of life form all by themselves. Because, like I said, there's there's just an almost innumerable combina uh, amount of combinations. But these things can uh, these sp supposedly different species can reproduce and produce what we would call a new species. Now. Like I said, we don't know how many species there really were. Not only that, we don't even know how many are going extinct because uh, the World Wildlife Fund says that 10,000 species disappear every year, but I don't believe that because I don't even think that's possible. I've read much different numbers on this. Another source said that only 800 species have gone extinct in the past 500 years, which I think is probably more realistic. Mm -hmm. We don't even know how many species there are. There's others that we don't know about. They keep finding more because they're, they form by themselves. Now, one of, the, uh, one of the explanations for this that I'm familiar with, that I learned from the late Ernest Martin, was that he thinks that the creation of God is still going on. It had never stopped. And I think that that is very plausible. That, that would explain a few things, but I don't think it wouldn't really necessarily have to be that way because when you look at all the different uh, genetic combinations there are, I mean, the possibilities are almost endless.
So you have to keep that in mind. So it's not really a problem with with what God is doing, it's a problem with what the demons are doing. And now these things are going to be, it's going to be forms of life that, I, that I'm sure will be destroyed. Now we have good forms of bacteria, we have bad bacteria. Why do we have bad bacteria? Well, it's a curse. Same thing with parasites, same thing with the diseases. Where did they come from? Well, were they created by demons? Were they created by God? I'm not really sure. But they're not going to be around forever, as far as I can tell. And what are animals going to be like? What's the potential of animals in the millennium? Now, we already know about this. And uh, in the millennium, there won't be any more fear. It'll be like the way that it was, and it won't be any carnivorous animals. So let me just read from, well, let's see. How about uh, Isaiah 6, verses 6 through 9, 11, 6 through 9. The cow and the bear shall graze. Their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like an ox. The nursing child shall play by the cobra's hall, and the weaned child shall put his hand in the viper's den. They shall not hurt or destroy in all of my holy mountain. So these, these creatures will still exist. But they'll have a different nature. They won't be afraid. And if they're not afraid, they're not going to attack. And if they're not going to eat meat, they're certainly not going to attack. Now, what do we have? What happens? When, what about when animals attack? Are they provoked, like I said before? And they're really, it's really not their nature to do that. Now, I've seen uh, footage of people swimming in the ocean. There's hundreds of people in the water. And just farther out, you can see sharks hanging around within sight of the people. They can see the people they could eat. They could be chowing down to people anytime they want, but they don't do that because that's not really their nature to do that. Now, when sharks have attacked people, I think it's usually a case of mistaken identity. And they thought they were a seal or a walrus, I guess. Because they have opportunities to eat people, but they don't. Now, a few years ago, I, I remember on the news, there was a, a story about Aaron Rodgers. And the off season went scuba diving. And it was footage of him swimming with a shark, and he was petting the shark on its head like it was a cat or a dog. Of course, all the Packer fans were all freaking out because they thought we, we almost lost our star quarterback. But it was really cool. This pet, this this shark was really very friendly. And I thought, well, that's not what we were used to hearing about, about sharks. Whenever we hear about sharks, it's when they attack people, which is very rare, by the way. Great white. Right. And the same thing with other animals. Now, uh, like I said, when animals attack, it's because they're, they're either, they're it's almost always because they feel threatened. And when they have attacked people, it's not to eat them. I can only think of two kinds of creatures that have actually eaten people. Sharks are one, and then you got the alligators and the crocodiles. <clears throat> and there, there have been some bizarre cases. There was the USS Indianapolis, which was torpedoed uh, July 30th, 1945. 580 men died in the water. A lot of them died from sharks. It was the worst unknown shark attack against humans of all time. Mm -hmm. But in that case, there was blood in the water, and it turned into a feeding frenzy. But that was unusual. And uh, now, <clears throat> there won't be any more carnivorous animals. There won't be any more fear in the millennium. And we will have pets that, of every animal. So where are we now? Do I have any comments? Yeah. Um, Paul and Lorraine have been patiently waiting with their hand up. Go ahead. Oh, Illinoisan. Okay, thanks guys. Um, so first thing is why demons, you know, messing with the DNA before the flood? Why not humans like they are now? Um, the next thing is in terms of kinds, we have, I don't know how many do dog breeds we have to this day, but you know, Noah didn't have Pomeranians and Yorkies and Labradors and um, all the different dog breeds there was a single progenitor 
that over time man has manipulated through, you know, this is natural means, this is animal husbandry, just simple science, um, creating all these different kinds. They're not necessarily, not kinds, um, different variations within the kind. I'm trying to be very careful in terms of the, you know, the words I'm choosing, you know, because for me, species is the difference between a human and an elephant, okay? Um, but when you're talking about lions and tigers and, and leopards and um, all those different um, uh, you know, cat-like um, creatures being able to you know, breed across um, the line, so to speak, and therefore, I don't know if they can, if they're uh, sterile afterwards, or if they can actually uh, create um, that goes beyond, like the dogs. When you when you're manipulating those those breeds, you actually can create something that can continue to procreate. Whereas when you cre uh, cross a donkey and a mule, even though they're technically an equine species, they're not going to be creating something that can perpetuate. So um, they're, they're in essence sterile. So I, I don't know if we're necessarily creating more species as we are creating variations within the species. Um, and then the last thing I had was, you know, you were quoting about, well, why do we have bad bacteria? Well, we have bad bacteria because there's death and disease. You know, when there's no more death and disease, we don't really need it. And God has that in place as a way to uh, clean things up. It's why we have scavengers. You know, if we didn't have something in the ocean, cleaning the ocean, um, the, the water would be polluted. You know, I, I can't remember how much water a clam purifies. I, I think it's like nine cubic uh, feet of water. And, you know, collects mercury and everything, you know, basically cleans it all up. And, you know, God forbid, and he did forbid that we eat those, you know, because if I really wanted to eat my um, my filter in my fish tank, that's basically what I'd be doing. <laughs> but, um, you know, so these other things had to be put into place to take care of the curse. Does that make sense? So he always had a, has a purpose for things. You know, parasites are there, bacteria, are there, they're all there because uh, there's death, you know, and if there's no death, there's no reason for insects and other things to come and clean up, you know, the carrion and the dead things. Um, there, there shouldn't be any reason, I, I guess. So that, that's my thoughts. Thank you. Um, Bill? Um, yeah, I want, I want to go back to, uh, <clears throat> the radiocarbon dating, uh, with the statement made there. Radiocarbon has a half-life of 5,700 years, approximately 6,000 years. Um, so that doesn't mean, okay, like, let's say if you had a half-life means that if you go one half-life, I'm just going to use 6,000 years instead of 5,700 years for a half-life of carbon-14. That means you got half as much material. So if you go, say you had 80 grams, uh, and by the way, these archaeologists are not likely to give up a, a whole lot of their stuff. It has to be, uh, they have to be burned up and then the, the carbon in it checked. But let's say you have 80 grams of carbon-14, then uh in 6,000 years, you'd have 40 grams. And then another 6,000 years, you'd have 20 grams. And another 6,000 years, you'd only have 10 grams left. Another 6,000 years, five grams, and then two and a half. Uh, so once it runs out, you can make something as old as you want. So the statement that it's only good for 6,000 years is really opposite after 60,000 years. And I'm not saying that the animals are older than 60,000 years, but that, that's one thing. And then um, the thing that's really awesome uh, is uh, 
you, you might be able to see this. It's it's out of National a National Geographic, uh, and uh, this particular one uh, has about the mammoths, and uh, the, the, this is a picture inside there of the guys uh, getting tusks. They're taking 60 tons of mammoth tusks per year just out of the northern Siberia islands. Um, and uh, here's a guy, here's a picture of a guy. He's got a long lance spear type thing. And if you can see it, he's chipping, see this tusk sticking out of this, what they call rock ice. It's a mixture of mud and body parts and tree parts. And they're searching up there in these Northern Siberia islands in August when things are thawing out. They get $40,000 approximately for each one of these tusks. And they ship them to China and China carves like uh, $250,000 worth of ivory idols out of them. And uh, here's a picture of their, the, the carvings of the, in, in China, one of the tusks they're carving the ivy or got. But um, my, my study of this, I'm a degreed mechanical engineer and there's a guy, uh, Walt Brown, who's got a doctorate in mechanical engineering and in physics, he's got a bunch of doctorates. He only believes in 6,000 years, but he brings up as a good scientist should, some of the problems that they have with only believing in 6,000 years and not, and he does mention the gap there. He, does, he says, his really nice hardback book is Against Evolution. And he does have two pages where he mentions the, the gap theory. And he says, at least these people that teach the gap theory are against evolution. <laughs> but um, he, one of the things that stands out is that these mammoths were frozen solid. And he even in his research with bird's eye foods of trying to put meat in at 175 below zero and see how fast the meat will, will freeze. A multi-ton mammoth being frozen solid in 15 minutes is what, what she says, you know, because of the foods in their mouth still, they've bit it off and uh, what's in their stomach. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a mystery, he says, to them. There's another, uh, another National Geographic, uh, and this is called um, uh, Ice Baby, uh, th th and they call it Dima. This was the, the first or the only completely flesh as <clears throat> a baby mammoth. Uh, they had it in Japan and, and looking at its um, stomach and, and, uh, and looking at why that it died. <clears throat> so if you want to, uh, if you want to go on, uh, if you put like the plainer truth about God's Jurassic Park, you go online, a guy has picked up my article about what happened, but to make the gist of it, the air is 80% nitrogen. And uh, Jesus said, I saw Satan fall as lightning from heaven. So when Satan was knocked down from heaven, when he tried to take over God's throne in Isaiah and Ezekiel, he and the angels with him knocked the earth out of orbit into 400 degree below zero and the nitrogen in the air would turn to liquid. And, and some of these animals got bathed in liquid nitrogen because you can imagine if the earth was knocked out of orbit, all the oceans would slosh. And then the only place for the oceans to go would be back towards the earth. So it rips up the whole earth and that's what they find. And there, by the way, there are no human bones in, in this, in all these studies of this rock ice with all the animal parts. And he, he lists all the animals that they found up there in the north, there are no human bones in there at all. So this was not something that happened with the flood. <clears throat> but um, several things, I, I discussed this with this guy that has the doctor that wrote this book, Walt Brown. And by the way, it's online. You can go and you can look at, he's got a lot of details of all the different animals found up there frozen. Uh, I discussed it with him and I said, I, I have a solution to how these animals could have been frozen solid in 15 minutes is when if the earth was knocked out of orbit to 400 degrees below zero nitrogen becomes liquid at about 350 below so some of these animals got bathed in liquid nitrogen 
And when they breathed it in, it would cause them to be suffocated. And both of these articles and uh, Walt Brown's book say that it appears that the ones that they found were suffocated. And it, is, and it says that right here and even in the National Geographic. So uh, my analysis is we've been right about the pre-Adamic creation. Uh, the, the Earth was knocked out of orbit uh, when Satan tried to take it over. And uh, then one last thing, and I'll, I'll be through, is that even the evolutionists, there's a, there's a heresy among the evolutionists because I saw on one of the programs, uh, Discovery Channel, some of the evolutionists have agreed the only way this could have happened is the Earth was knocked out of orbit. And so they actually showed a video where they made up of this giant meteor hitting the Earth and knocking it out of orbit. It was interesting. They showed the meteor as a giant ball of light. And I thought, isn't that interesting? Scripture said, Jesus said, I saw Satan fall as lightning from heaven. <laughs> Anyway, uh, so that's my orbit. pitch. When when did it come back into orbit? Well, then we all then, frozen. then when God brought it back into orbit, and as we know from our from the teaching uh, and from the Hebrew Genesis, that's what the gap theory is. Genesis one one, and then Genesis one two says, and the earth was in the King James without form and void, but it can be translated without. It's tohu and bohu can be can be without form in a mess. Right. So okay. then God, God would bring it back. <clears throat> and then there's one other thing that's important in this. And I I shock people. And uh, one of the corporates has even picked this up They th that I made the comment. It's nowhere it says in six days God created the heavens and the earth. People go, what? Are you crazy, Bill? You go read it says in six days, God made the heavens and the earth. In Genesis 2, verse 3, I think it is, it says, this is the generations of the heaven and the earth in the day that God created and made. So as an engineer, I would create something on computer, and then I'd go make it. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and then in seven days, uh, <clears throat> Yahweh number two made the heavens and the earth. There, well, there's two I, different. I thought that meant the same thing, and I have to ask you, what what was what kind of creation was in the pre-Adamic world? Was it there were no humans? Well, so so that I, I look at. I mean, this is this is how I this is my position. Okay, <clears throat> that's what the scholars say. Position instead of what I, um, that the God's Jurassic Park was created for the angels to have fun with. And when we saw the movie Jurassic Park, we see how excited people were to see all these animals that they, the archaeologists thought they knew how they were. So that what I see. And then they also have the scripture uh, where it says the angels which kept not their first estate. So I, I'm just telling you my position and my from an engineering uh, and, and uh, heat transfer it's virtually impossible any other way to say how the mammoths were frozen solid in 15 minutes with food still in their mouth that they bit off. Well, okay. I mean, that's, that's a story all by itself. And if you're saying the earth was knocked out of its orbit, it had to come back at some time, but uh, that's another story. As far as the fossils go, they're less than even the ones in the bottom layers are less than 60,000 years old. They're apparently all the layers are the same age. They were formed at the same time, and I don't know what forms of life there were before that that are not in the fossil record. <clears throat> but uh, supposedly life goes okay. The scientists are going to tell you life goes back billions of years. But you know, one of the reasons why they're why they're coming up with that it's something called radiometric dating. And I want to read to you a quote from the Utah Geological Survey about radiometric dating, and it says. Radiometric dating generally yields the, late, the rate of metamorphism, not the age of the original rock. So it's a dating method that does not give you an actual age. All they knew is they could tell you that the rate of decay of all these elements are, but you would have to know the exact mineral content of the rock when it was formed in order to put a date on it. And I, even on the History Channel, on the, on the show Ancient Aliens, they said there's no way to put a date on a piece of rock. 
and they're trying to hand us this stuff about the Earth being four and a half billion years old based on uh, radiometric dating. And here's another thing about this. They've done uh, radiometric dating on all different rocks. They've had dates as, as old as 65 billion years old, according to their reading. What they're not going to tell you about that, they know that they're wrong. They're getting all different wild kinds of dates. They've taken, they did, they did uh, radiometric dating on lava from Mount St. Helens, which erupted in 1980. They did this six years later, and they were getting dates as old as 23 million years. They're getting all different dates from every sample, and it's not 23 million years. It was six years. So they, and they don't tell you about that. It's a totally unreliable method, but they're going to keep, continue to use it. They're going to keep handing us these lies with these false dates. Mm -hmm. So as far as the earth being four and a half billion, I don't believe that. Now I'm not going to say for sure that it's 6,000, but I'm just saying you can't go by what the, the world of science has been telling us because they're using wrong flawed methods. Now with the case of carbon 14, it's different because it only works with living things and it doesn't go back more than 60,000 years according to Encyclopedia Britannica. I think it goes back less than that. But at least we know that the things in the fossil record are less than 60,000 years old. And that tells me that maybe that gap theory doesn't really hold up. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, let me say, Don, I do not disagree with the 60,000 years, and I can disagree with the millions of years. I, I, I'll, I'll just say that. But 60,000 years is a lot different than 6,000. Okay. Well, I'm not saying, I'm not saying the Earth is 60,000 years old. I'm saying it's less than that. I don't know how much less, but it's got to be less. Um. I was going to make a comment here, and then we go to uh, Paul and Lorraine. Um, the book, uh, I know the, the book of Enoch is a uh, non-canonized, there's some problems with it, but it's a fun source to use to try to get a picture of life pre-flood. And in there, uh, I'm trying to think what chapter it was, uh, Enoch is, is walking along, and he gets summoned by some demons and the demons are saying they say go to god and petition for our release we've been wrongly uh we're being wrongly kept and uh enoch goes to god and god says no you are not supposed to intervene for them they're supposed to intervene for you they are they are being kept because they gave man knowledge they were not supposed to have. Um, and in other places too, it talks about the demons passing things along to mankind that they weren't supposed to know yet. So for all that's worth. Um, Paul Marine? Yeah, Mark, we had mentioned this before, the irony of how they say that the layer of the rock tells you the age of the fossil um, but the type of fossil tells you the age of the rock with circular reasoning and then um, you know kind of going back to the book of Enoch it it is um, like you said Don it is uh, interesting mm -hmm. um, to say the least but you know going back to my original thought um, about there being evil human beings that are implementing this manipulation of the DNA. Um, once you understand the building blocks of how God has created things, um, so-called having that knowledge that, uh, uh, like you said in the book of Enoch, that um, God didn't want humans to have yet, uh, we're seeing that today. You know, um, what is going to be the fruit of that experiment? Uh, I think many of us are holding our breaths, hoping, you know, for the best, but also stealing ourselves for, you know, something else. Um, but, you know, needless to say, here we are, you know, is, and the irony I think of this is I have to wonder if the seduction was by you having this knowledge about how God creates you become gods yourselves. And so therefore, like, is probably why we're seeing today 
um, these folks in the medical industry, you know, thinking that they have, you know, unlimited power um, and the things that they're doing to people and animals, by the way, Mark, you know, coming back, uh, circling back to your original topic, um, which leads me back to the pre-flood. Why did God need to destroy everything? Because everything was corrupted, human and animal, everything. And I'm thinking to myself, wow, how could, how could Noah be perfect in his generations? Are we talking in terms of faith, spiritual? Are we talking genetics? You know, possibility. I mean, as we're, as we're kind of talk, having this discussion tonight, that's, those are some of the things that, um, you know, are, are, you know, kind of uh, mulling about in my mind. And then also you have the, uh, the verse that says, so in the days of Noah, so shall be, you know, like in our times, that is if these are those times, I should say, qualifying it. But um, anyway, those are just, just some thoughts. Yes. Well, mm -hmm. I, I agree. And I just wanted to mention Matthew 13, 25, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed into his field, but while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. And that's basically what I'm saying has happened in the animal kingdom too. Uh, it's the enemy that's been corrupting things and it's only temporary. It's going to change. I mean, <coughs> Originally, Adam and Eve, they didn't have to uh, cultivate. They didn't have to pull weeds. And everything they needed was right there. And that's how it's going to be. And then, of course, there's Ezekiel 34, which I didn't put down here, but it says they will sleep in the woods and uh, they will make the evil, the, the beast cease from the land and nothing will make them afraid. And uh, people have been afraid of animals. Animals have been afraid of people, but uh, that's all going to change. And now, uh, what about carnivorous animals? I mean, they cannot, they were made carnivorous. That's how they were designed. And that's how their bodies, like uh, the big cats, they cannot digest cellulose. They can only digest meat and milk. And that's just how they're created. But their whole physical nature was corrupted and it's going to be changed back. Now, here's another thing. When it comes to clean and unclean, some people think that I knew I used to know a guy that wouldn't pet a cat or a dog because it's uh, he thought because they were unclean. And he said he thought you couldn't touch an unclean animal. But just uh, just remember that. When Noah brought the animals on the ark, God told him to bring seven of each clean animal and one of mm -hmm. each or two of each unclean. Well, there were unclean animals on the ark because God wanted them preserved. And just because they're not clean to eat doesn't mean that they're evil. And it doesn't mean you can't touch them. I just remember that God's people rode on camels and they rode on horses. Jesus rode on a donkey on that final Passover of his life. Those are all unclean animals. And it's not wrong to touch them. And they're not inherently evil. You just can't eat them. That's all it's saying. And then remember, that God told Noah to, to divide up the animals by between clean and unclean. This was like nine centuries before Moses wrote Leviticus 11 with the dietary laws. Well, that's because the laws were in effect from day one. You know, why else would be, why else would Abel be sacrificing, right? Yeah. Someone mm -hmm. had to take in that. You know, so I, I think many things were already in place because then why did God say, remember the Sabbath? You know, why did he, why didn't he say, hey, now the seventh day of the week is going to be your Sabbath? No, he said, remember the Sabbath because it had been instituted from the very beginning, just like everything else. Bill? Bill? Yeah, Mark, I, uh, that was very good comments. Uh, the people that think you can't even pet a dog or something, that is so funny. 
and David had dogs too, and you brought up thing about Christ riding the whole thing. You did a good job of explaining how foolish the idea you couldn't pet an unclean animal. Well, isn't there a scripture about the poor man, the dog shall lick its wounds? Yes. <laughs> so well, that was uh, that was uh, Lazarus. Lazarus and a rich man, and he, he had wounds, and the dogs would lick his wounds. But uh, right, but the, uh, I guess it's the female dog actually can the, the, the licking is actually cleansing. The male is bad. The female has to has cleaning. I never heard that. Yeah, a lot of well told by a vet. Now, supposedly a dog's mouth is cleaner than a human's, but I never well, really uh, believe that one, man. Yeah. Okay. Well. Okay, but um, the, um, that thing about Mark about the uh, the sixty thousand years with carbon fourteen. See, once you get past about ten half lives, and there's nothing left, then you can make something as old as you want. Uh, so uh, that's why the evolutionists get around that. But I mean, I, I don't believe in the millions of years. Uh, either, but <clears throat> well, I'm, I'm just saying that if they ever hand you a date that's more than 60,000 years, they're not using common 14, they're probably using radiometric dating, which of course is a fraud. Yeah, I, I, I agree, and uh, but I hope you, you understand what I'm saying is that for a multi ton mammoth to be frozen solid in 15 minutes, there's there's no other explanation that I, from science. And even I talked to this guy that has a double, several doctorates in physics and mechanics. I've talked to him. He's a 6,000 year guy. He knows about the Sabbath. And I said, how are you going to explain this? And he, he says, you know, there's a problem. And then he said, well, you know, the great fountains of the deep were broken up. And so it blasted this water up into the other atmosphere and it became ice and fell down on these animals. And his name is Walt Brown. And I, I said as one engineer to another, Walt, you know that ice is an insulator. The English, the, the Eskimos have, it's not going to freeze a multi mammoth in 15 minutes. And he, I almost got him convinced. Nothing. Dan, did you have something to say? Your mic's unmuted. Oh, I I don't know how that happened, but I see the uh, it's unmuted. I was thinking about what life was like back in the days of uh, Noah, you know, the 1500 or so years up until then. And I've read uh, here and there about even they had nuclear weapons back then. They were taught a lot of things. And there's seas, there's like glass. The guy, the geologist, is driving over an area, ran over what the sound, and it got out to the truck to see what it was, and it was breaking glass all over. And how did that happen? Well, so, I think you're like, talking about, uh, isn't that Mohenjo Daro in northern India? I, I, this sounds like it's what it was. All right, they had that on the History Channel, and it's called vitrification. And that's, that's what happened when they detonated uh, the, the first atomic bomb in Alamogordo, New Mexico, on July 16th, 1945. It, turned, it melted the sand and turned it into glass. And that's what happened in uh, Mohenjo Daro, northern India. And nobody knows when. Right. But uh, they also found xenon-29, which, which only forms in a, an atomic explosion. And nobody can explain how they could have done that. In an, in an ancient world, but apparently they did. Yeah, and I was thinking, yeah, the Yeshua said that, yeah, the end times will be as the days of Noah. So yeah. we look at our end times and say, so what is going on? Okay, you're having animal abuse, being testing, uh, testing out for the pharmacia. And uh, so I would assume that the animals back then were also being tested, and uh, and they were going into uh, putting different uh, 
you know, figures together, whether human and animal, you know, from mirrors, and from, you know, any different uh, type of uh, combinations, too. And so it just makes sense to me that that is what was going on back then, is what we see now. Yeah. And so it's just like, uh, yeah, it's some pretty wicked stuff and pretty evil stuff that was going on. And uh, it was like, yeah, there wasn't any different back then versus now. I don't think. I think because they supposedly were taught by the fallen angels about how to make different weapons and stuff like that. And, and so there you go. Now you got the same bottom atmosphere, bottom, uh, you know, characterization of the humans is what we have right now. And it's still, it, it, to me, it shows that, yep, he's going to be back soon. So, however soon that is, but it'll be back soon. I think. And the animals and the plants and everything are going to be happy. About it. It, it was um, talking to a gentleman, oh, this is years ago, who was a nuclear, uh, he worked for some power company, and he was a nuclear guy. And I said, what What would happen if there was a, a nuclear war? How long would it take to clean up, and how would you do it? And he talked about it would dissipate and this and that. And he said the fastest way to do it would be to cover it with moving water, high in calcium and certain minerals. You think about it. You flood the earth. And how long did that water sit on the earth? Could have just been the flood was necessary to clean. Yeah, it was. The garbage? It was a year. Was that, it, or, I think right, it was. A year. I'm just saying, you know, based on what he was saying, the cleanest, fastest way to clean it up would be to cover it with an immense amount of water. That kind of makes sense, doesn't it? So, um, any other comments? Feel free to raise that, raise that, click on that, raise hand. Uh, I, there's another thing one of the brethren's brought up that with the clean animals that Noah took on the ark, it was seven, it says seven sevens, male and his female. So we, we know it's 14, but they brought up, it also says for the unclean, two twos. So they said there were actually four of the unclean and 14 of the clean. I, I did check the Hebrew and it does say two twos as well as saying seven sevens. Paul Lorraine. Um, Paul, what, would you, what were you guys how, how do you guys explain Australia? <laughs> yeah, Paul wants to know how to explain Australia with its crazy duck-billed poisonous marsupials. <laughs> poisonous duck-billed marsupials? Yeah, very poisonous. Yeah, you get you get uh, stung by a male. Those back claws are very poisonous. Really? Horribly painful. Definitely painful. Yes, not to another. Uh, I mean, they have to fight. Giants spider giant spiders that completely convinced me never to visit there. <laughs> well, um, in the spring, it rains spiders. That's how they travel. Right. When it's spider season, yeah. Have you seen those pictures? It's pretty scary. <laughs> well, it can't be worse than Brazil. That's where you, you don't uh, you want to go there, man. They got uh, almost everything there is deadly. It's so almost like being in Chicago. Right, yeah. Well, that's <laughs> like Piranaville. Uh -huh. Well, that's all I got. 